Hello guys, welcome back to another live segment on Friday the 31st of March 2023 for a carnivore muscle ramblings session with myself and my delightful VIP guest, Jerome Armstrong. Thank you for having me on, Jonathan. My pleasure. It's, um, it's always fun doing these and it's nice to connect to someone from the other side of the world near enough that's um, into the same thing as me. It seems to be very niche. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm grateful for the titles that you seem to give me every single time we go live. Well, I've had the um, I've had the pleasure of being in your in your videos before. You've interviewed me, and you give me um, the mountain of the man. Yeah, that the, personal um, trainer par excellence. I think I said too. Lots of things like that. <laughs> uh, Sophie cracks up every time I say it to her. She loves it. <laughs> All right, we've got some questions. I believe. I think you've put them in the chat already. Yep, uh, two from your last carnivore coaching corner that went unanswered due to time constraints. Ah, brilliant. I'll get to those first, and I'll address the other people in the, um, the questions. Question from last Q and A from Matt Anderson: How often should you switch exercises during a workout? Um, I think you can run an exercise forever indefinitely, providing the perimeters of being able to do that are in point. Um, are you recovering okay? Are your joints fine? Um, are you getting better from each workout to the next? Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to get better from workout one to workout two. It might be workout one to eight of the same body part of the same exercise. It might be near enough the same in terms of weight lifted and form and all that sort of thing. It might not be to the ninth that you've actually progressed because you've been neglecting your recovery in that sort of aspect. Um, and I was saying that, I don't know many people that have been doing the same workout for, for example, 20 years. Um, <laughs> people usually change exercises, so I think it's theoretically possible. Um, depends how, how, how hard you're able to train in a given exercise. I don't believe in the muscle confusion principle from Arnold Schwarzenegger that he said about back in the day. I believe on a QA and a recently, someone, I think it's Colt mentioned he read the book and the um, Arnold's Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding. Whilst it has some good information there, it's quite useful to give you ideas, but you know, muscles don't know confusion. They know this was hard, this wasn't hard. They don't necessarily get confused. They know how to respond um, and react to a stimulus. Um, it's not, they're not muscles don't get confused. They don't have a mind of their own, at least mm -hmm. in that kind of context. Um, now, how often? I mean, some people do what I think they call meso cycles or training blocks where they have exercise A. Now run it, or run it, whatever that means, for four to six weeks, then I'll change it. Um, why do you need to change it every four to six weeks or in a given time frame? Um, there's some exercises I do find I enjoy more than others, and I'll they'll be more of a mainstay of my training program. Uh, it might be that you have to do a, a horizontal row, for example. Um, if I've got a weak mid-back, I'm going to choose exercises and execute different um movements which target my mid-back. So it might be that I'm in a gym with one exercise piece of equipment that allows me to do that. So it might just be I run run that movement indefinitely. Um, might not be the start or end of a workout or in somewhere in between, it might change all the time. Um, how often? I really don't know. Um, I'd, 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 I'd play it by trial and error and see what works. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can use muscle soreness as an indicator of if you've worked the muscle hard enough, if it is accurate, if it is the area you want to build up. Uh, most people that are quite new to training just need to build up everything. Just train everything. Train everything hard. Um, do, you, do, do the best you can. What do you think, Drew? Yeah, there's a, a lot of points there. Um, one thing I would say is Schwarzenegger's book does have a lot of good information in it, but Arnold's philosophy of exercise is 50 years old at this point um so the encyclopedia of modern bodybuilding still suggests that cable curls will give you more peak um barbell curls will give you more width in your biceps if you take a wider grip it'll work the lateral head if you work the or sorry the medial head of your bicep a more narrow grip works the lateral head of your bicep and these are things that you know exercise selection can slightly shift overload a bit but for the most part um exercise execution is going to be far more important Another thing that's going to dictate exercise selection and when you switch up workouts, sometimes it's just the equipment that you have available to you. 
Um, uh, Jonathan, I know, I think you, you train at home sometimes, sometimes you go to a gym and like not every gym is going to have the same equipment. So you're, you're kind of forced sometimes to do different exercises. One advantage, if you're able to keep your exercise selection essentially as limited as possible, it allows you to more objectively track progress in a short term and intermediate term basis. Um, so if every single week you have a converging chest press and you can do that same chest press, that exact same machine, you can more accurately measure progress on a workout to workout basis. Now, sometimes if you just have a week where for whatever reason, you may want to do a, a different pressing movement, that's fine, but it, it may interfere with your ability to just object, or I keep saying objectively, uh, to continue to measure that progress. I tend to think um, as long as you're hitting your muscles with enough intensity, giving them enough time to recover, um, just switch up movements kind of when you feel like it. For the most part, it doesn't matter how long you train a movement. If, if you're getting enough variety over time, um, you're going to near optimally develop your muscles as well as you can. And, you know, I think if you get tired eventually of just doing straight up and down underhand pull downs, if you lean back a little bit, you hit it a little bit differently. Um, small little variations like that over time will just help you have a more balanced and developed physique, but it's nothing really to fret over. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, you kind of alluded to the point waste of putting intention into the muscle that you're trying to work. So, for example, you made the point about the lat pull down. Um, an under, underhand lap pull down straight up and down might put strain your wrists, um, might feel awkward on your elbows, I don't know. You might yeah. then lean back a bit. So that's changing the intent. So although the exercise is actually the same, you can change how each muscle group is um, worked in that same exercise. So you might even, for example, might be a shoulder press. Um, you might you should do a shoulder press machine like that. You might do one like that as well. So it might have both grips. Um, you might find that your, your shoulder's more impinged in that position. Might feel a bit more safer in a more neutral position. So you might do that for a few weeks. Yep. So on and so forth. So you can change some things um, quite a lot, even with the same piece of equipment sometimes. And you don't need to overcomplicate it. If you think of something like the biceps, the biceps essentially have what? Three physiologic functions. They, they supinate the, res, the wrist, excuse me, uh, elbow flexion. And because they cross the shoulder girdle, they function in humeral flexion to an extent. So as long as you're working an exercise that addresses all of those main uh, anatomical and physiologic functions of that muscle group, you're going to see some degree of results. And you can fine tune certain angles. You can you can mess with slightly different movements, but as long as you're addressing those, it's really not going to make too big of a difference. Thank you for your answer. Yeah, that makes complete sense to me. Um, hope that answers your question, Matt. If you have any more questions on that sort of topic, if you are in the chat right now. Um, please go ahead and ask, and I um, appreciate you following me on Instagram as well while you're at it. So thanks for that. <laughs> so you got another question from the last Q&A. Doing push-pull legs, thoughts on this workout? Goblet squats, three times eight to 12 reps. Bulgarian split squat, three times eight to 12 reps. Hip thrust, three times eight to 12 reps. Quad extension, three times eight to 12 reps. Hamstring curl, three times eight to 12 reps. Calf raise, three times eight to 12 reps. All right. What do you think, and Drew? The last, the last little bit of that question was, would four sets be better? And I that got cut off and I put it in the next part of the comment. Um, there's a lot to unpack about that. The actual is three sets or four sets better. Um, it's kind of an arbitrary question because it, it depends how you execute those three sets. Um, if those are really high intensity sets, three sets is probably sufficient. If you're unable to safely get a high degree of intensity out of those moments and train at least to near momentary muscular failure, um, you probably may need that fourth set. But in looking quickly at the exercise selection, um, I'm not the biggest fan of split squats or lunge movements because I, I think the balance component can detract from someone's ability to safely overload the muscles that they're trying to work. But if someone can safely and consistently execute them, um, then that's fine. But me personally, anytime I do any kind of lunge, anytime I do some kind of single legged movement, um, I feel that the bilateral nature compromises my knee stability. And I find that my knee will wiggle a little bit. And I'm not a fan of that when I'm loading muscles with weights. Um, so that's 
something this individual will have to address with his actual execution. Um, hip thrust is fine. Your glutes are probably getting enough work through the split squat. Um, leg extension, leg curl, calf raise. Yeah, most of that looks pretty decent, but more so than the specifics of the actual routine, because you're kind of hitting everything with the legs across all of those movements. Um, how are you executing those? Um, how much intensity can you drive out of those particular movements? And if you feel like you could do a fourth set, your intensity was probably lacking a bit in the first three, are kind of my superficial thoughts. Yeah, I think the same thing. Um, I know, for example, when you're doing a squat movement, um, leg extension, leg curl, if you're really trying that hard in even three sets, um, you'll notice like cramping in different muscles. And if you're going to concentric muscular failure, and even doing static hold at the um, the pause, you know, the pause position as well, that would be really tough on your body. Um, and this is for anyone. But, you know, we'll see sort of pro bodybuilders online do this sort of workout. It's like, you know, four, generic online is like four sets of 8 to 15 or whatever it is. And it'll be maybe four or five exercises in a leg workout. If you watch them doing it, although they are using a massive load, they're not training anywhere near muscular failure. They're training hard, you know, making all the sounds and all the um, grunting and that. But, you know, the weight moved in, in response to actually the, the cadence, the tempo, um, from repetition 1 to repetition 10. Is near enough identical um, there's no sort of slowdown in it so it just tells me they're not activating all the muscle fibers that you could so that's why they're doing more um, sets now you made a good point as well about the stability aspect you're going to be able to progressively overload very very well if you're using um, a squat movement which is with both legs versus one not many instances where i'm seeing pro bodybuilders at least do split squats um, in terms of like time efficiency, energy expenditure, you're going to be doing a hard workout. A leg workout is a hard workout if you're doing it properly, intensely. Um, mixing it up in this way is probably not beneficial long term in terms of progressing the lifts, as Jerome rightly said. Um, now, if you're doing more of the goblet squats, Bulgarian split squats, so more things which are almost, they, well, they could, theoretically, they could be body weight. Um, you may actually benefit from putting them further back in your routine, so you're, you've are you got more pre-exhaustion. So your muscle fibers won't know any different, they just think, this is hard, whereas if you're doing the leg curl quad section first, you know, they just think, oh, this, you know, lots of blood and muscle, soreness, uh, most of the muscle fibers are um, not burnt out per se, but they've been challenged. Then all the things that you've done after that, um, for the prerequisite quad and leg curls, um, that's really going to burn you out. It's going to make you tired. So the Bulgarian split squats, the goblet squats are going to be much more difficult if you put them later in the workout. So that will reduce the limitation you have from being able to progressively overload a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you're looking at long term. depends where you are now, what your goals are. Yep. This might be completely fine for you, you know. So don't take our word for it. Um, it's just booking a consultation with myself or perhaps Jerome and just ask. Um, we could really nail down your program if you look into this in more detail and find out what the issues you're having, um, maybe that'll help. I misspoke. I, I said bilateral when I meant unilateral, so I wanted to correct that. And I was laughing because what you said about possibly putting, you know, the leg extensions, leg curls earlier in the routine as to sort of pre-exhaust the goblet squat, that was a point that I wanted to make, but I had forgotten. Um, my natural inclination is if you start with a goblet squat, the amount of weight that you might have to hold, you know, near your chest could potentially be harder on your arms and your biceps might be a limiting factor in your goblet squat. So I generally, if you're going to have some kind of balance or skilled movement, like a Bulgarian split squat, I would probably put that first when your concentration and your focus is the highest as workouts tend to go on, people become more fatigued. They, they start um, maybe getting a little bit more distracted. And I, I tend to not like those types of movements later in the routine, especially if your legs are heavily fatigued and then going into that type of movement. So again, like Jonathan said, though, a lot of it's going to depend on your goals. Um, are you trying to emphasize more of one part of your lower body than the other? Um, what's your mindset of why you structured the routine the way that you did? But I would probably start with the leg extensions, leg curls um, from there. Or sorry, start with the Bulgarian split squat, then do leg extensions, leg curls, goblet squat, and finish up with calves if I were to use all of those movements 
at least without any further information. Perfect. Perfectly well said. Thank you very much, Drew. Um, speaking of, just asked a question about push pull leg routine question we just had. Um, a goblet squat, as Jerome rightly said, is just holding a weight in front of you. Usually it's a dumbbell. You can probably use a cable, but it's awkward, um, like a bar or a cable. Um, it's just doing a squat with a dumbbell in front of you like that. Uh, just a body weight squat, basically. Um, probably things, ways you can make it more difficult. You could put, probably put a platform beneath your heels or something. There's different variations, but then it becomes a point where you kind of might as well just use a machine which loads it specifically in a way for you. So I know my gym, for example, will have a V squat. Um, so that you can actually do, it's, it's a hack squat, but you can also face into it as well. And the, the bar will get over your shoulders and that eliminates that a factor of having to use your biceps sure. to hold a weight. John, if you, you give me that equipment. 30 seconds here. Sure, yeah. Yeah, so it'll make, make the job a bit easier okay. for you as well. Never mind. I had somebody open my door, but I think he was looking for the uh, insurance place down the hall. I'm in kind of a strip mall with my studio, so sometimes I get people that come to my door because I'm directly across from the entrance. Yeah, I, check, I checked it out on Google um, Images or Maps the other day, and it's quite, <laughs> quite, quite a sweet little place. Yeah, did you see the uh, picture of me outside peeing behind the building? <laughs> I didn't see that. No. Guys, check that out if you get a chance. Oh, yeah. I thought you were being serious. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Anyway, all right, so we do have Rick in the house, so thank you very much, Rick, for turning up today. Nice to see you. Um, Sophie's here currently sat on the side of the bed playing on her phone. <laughs> Hello, Tom, nice to see you. Thank you for joining today. Every time Tom joins the chat, he has a um, a funny way of mentioning us. I think, was it um, Ramblers at one point, then it was like Failures, now it's Muscle Destroyers. What's next? <laughs> I quite enjoy failures. I, I like yeah, that a lot. My dad used to say that, that, you know, going to the gym is the only time you ever really want to fail. Um, but yeah. I'm just, I'm rambling and reminiscing too much here. Nothing wrong with that. Kind of rambling. 17 minutes in, first ramble. Excellent. <laughs> Question. So, Jerome, how are your preparations going on? Um, what stage are you currently? Good luck at the show. Thank you. So I'm about three weeks out. My sleep is terrible. And um, I'm really on the fence right now whether I want to do this show. The whole reason I was going to do this show was to get into really good shape. And I've mostly done that. Um, and I've recorded quite a bit of training footage and transformation pictures and videos um, that by the end of next week, I, I'm going to put out kind of a teaser trailer. I'm trying to film everything just on my phone um, and make like a low budget documentary kind of showing this entire process. Um, but given that I have a little bit of loose skin on my stomach, you know, I don't go into competitions for the sake of competing, you know, winning is the goal. So knowing how I look um, and knowing how that may or may not tighten up as much as I want, um, I'm on the fence if I want to keep going and push all the way to the day of this competition. Um, my sleep is also terrible. I'm, I'm having nightmares that I'm binge eating food. Um, and that's affecting my time with my daughter um, being a single dad. And that's affecting to an extent how I, I'm handling and approaching my clients. I'm a lot more short tempered. I thankfully haven't snapped on anybody, but as Jonathan or anybody that's competed in the past knows, um, you have to feel real bad to look real good. And in a certain sense, um, I don't recommend competing to a lot of people. If it's something you want to do to have, to always know that you achieved something that not a lot of people can achieve, then there's a lot of good that can come out of that. Um, but in a lot of ways, your body doesn't want to get past a certain level of leanness. And you have to start doing a lot of things that, um, that aren't necessarily healthy you know, I'm manipulating your salt and water um, to try and look a certain way on the day of the stage. So I, with the short amount of time that I have, I know I can get there. Do I want to knowing that I've largely achieved my goal? Um, I don't know. I need to give that some more thought. Yeah, that's a sensible approach. Um, if you're like me, you can be pretty reckless and just go sort of Hail Mary sort of thing, just go nuts and just think, sort of, I don't care what happens. 
I've been in positions before where I couldn't really walk. Um, that's how lean I was. I mean, I'd, I wouldn't even, you know, full full disclosure here, I wouldn't even bother wearing boxers um, to go out. I'd just wear my, my shorts that I was wearing to go to the gym. Um, the thought of bending down to pick up my boxers to then put them up my legs versus just put the shorts up my legs was so much, it felt so challenging. That's how exhausting it is. Um, I don't think people realise how difficult it is. So you see guys, these guys on stage, you see them all full of energy and stuff, but the reality is these guys are trashed. Um, yeah. you get, they usually carb up a bit, so they'll feel a bit more perked up on the day, but uh, your body's in a very precarious state if you do it properly. Um, I remember I had a, had a period, I think, two weeks out of my show in 2018 where I won um, the Mr. Wales competition, and that was tragic. Um, I remember I cut my leg, I think. I, I think I, I fell slightly on the pavement somewhere and I grazed my leg only slightly but I was bleeding for ages hmm. I was bleeding for ages my body just wouldn't clot it and it was like this is worrying um, it healed up eventually but oh. I don't know if Jonathan froze up or maybe my internet may have Give frozen first there we go okay I hear you now see you Hmm. <laughs> right when right during the pinnacle of your story <laughs> so i hear and see you now okay um, i think we're good. back in the picture i okay. think we're good now yeah gotcha. i've got full signal on my wi-fi but apparently on here i don't so <laughs> mystery um I hope, we, hope they didn't annoy everyone. Um, yeah, anyway, so getting back to the point size, two weeks out, I was already in shape, you know, striated glutes. I couldn't lose more any, any more fat. Um, I was light, light, light for me. I think it was about 96, 95 kilos. And what happened was is I walked out of the gym. Um, I fell asleep on a bench. And I woke up. I fell asleep on the bench again. Then... <laughs> I was playing my phone, like trying to keep myself stimulated because I, I didn't have enough energy to walk from that bench to the the bus station to get my bus to get back home. Because at that point I was so trashed, I couldn't even walk the short 15 minute walk that I had to do to get back. Um, so yeah. I was effectively paying yeah. bus journeys just to get to and from the gym. Um, then I ended up buying some, I think some Haribo or some sweets or Skittles or something just to give me some energy because I was so depleted. But um, I think at that point, I almost feel like I started to lose muscle at that point because I was so weak. Um, like even doing my weights workouts was like lifting light weights. It just felt exhausting. Yeah. I think I needed like a good like three day refeed or something um, just to get myself perked up a bit. But you know, when the risk of doing that is you look dice to the socks. You're thinking, well, if I have this refeed, is that going to set me back? Um, then I, you know, I didn't have enough knowledge at the time, and I didn't have the refeed. I just had them. Um, a few sweets, I think, like so, maybe like 100 grams or something. I felt a bit better. Got home the next day, I was still shredded, so I didn't lose my abs or anything. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, just I just went on and I went on to win the show. Um, by a mile, it is the landslide across mm -hmm. the whole show. I was probably the leanest person, um, in that federation across the whole year, yeah. Yeah, so that's that's my experience with um. Diet, one of many experiences with dieting for competition. Uh, normally the last week, I, I pretty much just lay on the couch and watch TV and I can't really function at a high level besides that. Um, and yeah, it's sometimes just getting up and walking, you get lightheaded, you get out of breath very quickly. Um, and what a lot of people don't see is like, yeah, you, you pump up a little bit before you get on stage. But a lot of times, you know, a lot of those guys are sitting down or laying down the entire time backstage between, you know, the prejudging or when you have your little bit of time while your class is out there versus everybody else spending time out there it's uh it's a lot of time sitting around but yeah, it's probably it necessary takes a long time <laughs> it's um frustrating because it's never apart from once i think it's never been when organized for me it's been a case of am i on yet i'm not sure within the next hour then it's like four minutes later i'm on i'm like thanks for that yeah all right um i dieted 18 months this competition that was postponed four mm -hmm. times you're telling me i'm on in about four or five minutes so I, I apologize to everybody. I, I know I look really tired and uh, just my sleep has been just awful. <laughs> so I appreciate everyone's patience. I'm sure no one cares what you look like, Jerome. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, thanks. 
I mean, I'm, I'm here and I'm, I'm showing my face, so. <laughs> Whatever. You, I look like a kind of person that you run into at Walmart at three in the morning. With a pack of beers sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had, um, uh, say, uh, Sophie's friend came around actually yesterday and I had some dermablading done. So like some skin thing done. I don't know what it was. I think it's like shaving your face or something. And it sure. felt quite nice and I was quite relaxed and um, it's rejuvenated me. <laughs> I'm looking at Sophie and she doesn't say much. Hmm. They think. can't hear me, so what's the point of me saying anything? They can hear you, just about. Can they? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he can He looks hear. beautiful with his headband. Yes. Very good. <laughs> hello, Lamps, and hello, Kyle. Hi, Kyle. I joined a conversation recently, um, Kyle. Nice to, nice to speak with you. Um, body weight pistol squats is a good one. You can load them too, little fly to weight. Yeah, true. Yeah, it's just mm. a stability thing. Um, what most people coming to the channel are on about is building muscle, generally speaking, but we can talk about any sort of um, training modality to build fitness, stability, and anything like that as well. Uh, most of my actual training experience does like coaching people is in sports performance in relation to that. Um, bodybuilding is my own endeavor that I've learned myself. Um, oftentimes it's not closely related. Um, Jerome actually put a really good video out recently, if you haven't already seen it, about training and how you should... It's kind of like training specificity, but also using resistance machines versus not. Um, maybe you can explain that a bit better, just as a little plug there for you. Sure. You're talking more about the the balance component. Are you talking about the long presentation or the one that I just did um, the other day? I think the balance one. Oh, sure. So, yeah, I, I put a clip of this long presentation I did. Um, I spent last five, six weeks reading pretty much everything I could on athletic training, skill specificity, motor learning. And because of that, there was a lot of um, balance that was covered in this research. And a lot of the researchers found that um, there's no general phenomena called balance. And a lot of ways, um, improving balance in one skill doesn't oftentimes translate over to other skills, even if they're somewhat similar. Um, a lot of the improvements that happen in these more balance oriented uh, exercises tend to be just from improving a lot of the deep muscles uh, relative strength. Um, so um, yeah, you're probably best looking at the presentation. I, my brain is a, a little fried having spent as much time going into the weeds with that as I did. I, I hope yeah, that kind of if you haven't seen it, watch, what you're watch looking it, for, good. Jonathan. Yeah. Yeah, honestly, watch it. It was, um, it was a blockbuster. <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> Thank you. Good though. evening, Joe. How's it going? Joe, I think you have an email from me if you want to check it at some yep. point um, at your leisure. And Joe, we did address your push-pull legs uh, thing earlier in the video in case you hopped on a little bit late. Yeah, perfect. These resistance bands are good to use for leg exercises. Band under feet and on band of back of neck. Slow down, explosive up. Yeah. Yeah, they're hard. They're difficult. I mean, I did most of that, I believe, during the second lockdown in the UK. I was using near enough entirely resistance bands with the exception of, we'll see things like calisthenic push-ups, um, some chin-ups off a, a bar hanging off a beam. Um, yeah, and I maintain my muscle quite well. Um I felt like my grip strength was better because I was using a lot. I wasn't using machines as much. It's more like just body weight, like pure grip, grit, like gripping things and um, the bands as well. When you actually grip the bands, that does a lot of little stuff to your wrists, I think. So mm -hmm. my strength was different then, I think. Exercise bands, too, have a, a positive resistance curve. The further you stretch them, the harder it becomes to stretch them. And if you're doing a, a more compound leg exercise, like a, any kind of squat type movement, um, that movement has an ascending strength curve too. So exercise bands can be really, really good at more closely matching the strength curve of certain movements. Um, and in other movements, um, not so much, but definitely for the legs, um, they can be excellent. Yeah, very good. Hey, Susie, how's it going? Happy Friday. 
Tom asked, what are your thoughts on a high fat, adequate protein diet? Wanting to experiment how I feel on a similar diet to Amber Hearn, wondering how I feel with higher ketone levels. Um, I mean, it's difficult. So if, if your protein is adequate and your fat is very high, um, you'll get to a point where you won't just produce more ketones. So it'll be, um, it'll be the late, the rate limiting factor will be how much protein you're having. So if, if you're on that cusp of like having, um, enough for gluconeogenesis, then an extra amount for fat, sorry, an extra amount of fat for energy, um, you'll get a ketone level of here. But if your protein's a bit lower, your fat's a bit higher, then the ketones will rise higher to almost make up for that somewhat lack of gluconeogenesis. Um, you do find that you feel better. I mean, I felt better. I know Jerome definitely feels better. Um, I wouldn't be too concerned about percentages. That's something that I believe she promotes. And they are useful guidelines. But, I mean, how do you know if you'll feel better at uh, 81% or 79% or 80%? Until you've hit those points, you won't know. Uh, your body's dynamic. You, you know, I wouldn't verge on the side of getting exact ratios of percentages. The risk of not listening to your body. Um, and I think to eat a high fat diet in the way that she promotes is it's challenging because food isn't um generally speaking formed in that way um it's you won't for example find a 80 percent uh fat by caloric value ribeye steak very often uh, and even then if you have a ribeye steak how are we going to know it's got 80 percent fat by caloric value in it <laughs> so it's going to be a tricky one but um i think it's useful i found i did feel much better on it um the protein intake was around 180 at the time, and fat was something like, I've lost, I think about 380 or 350 or something like that is high. Um, I didn't notice any training performance dip, but I didn't notice my cognition was better. I felt calmer, like my sleep was definitely better. Um, skin was about the same. My general disposition was, I'd say it's still fine now, but it was good then it's better than what was before when i was doing very high protein lower fat um and what else yeah i think i think there's a benefit to it um i think there's a certain point where you your body will auto regulate itself to be at its homeostatic set point so you might not need higher fat at some point your body will just resist the fat mm -hmm. um your gallbladder might not pump out as much bile acid from the liver um by that point you will have um, hunger signals to say you know stop feeding me such fat butter will become unappealing um you'll be getting more for the rump steaks and the ribeye steaks yeah that's, that's pretty much what i think about it. what about you jerome i know you've been doing the higher yeah. fat for quite a while but perhaps you've had a change recently yeah i i wouldn't chase macros or ratios unless you're specifically just satisfying an intellectual curiosity to see how your body responds to it but there's also um you know, what's your current body composition like? Um, do you have any sort of uh, goals in the gym or, or athletic wise? Because those things can kind of factor in too. Um, what we tend to see with people that are eating about 80% fat, which is right around two grams of fat to every one gram of protein or higher, is these tend to be um, people that usually have more debilitating autoimmune conditions or, or possibly trying to take more of a medical healing approach, kind of like the Paleo Medicina approach out in Hungary um, recommends two to one. But when you look at the more Sean Baker, Anthony Chafee types, the people that tend to be a little bit leaner and are more the kind of sport and exercise performance oriented, I, I see more of those individuals skewing towards about one to one. Um, so if you just want to see kind of how you feel, um, you know, definitely try it. But what I'm seeing is a, a general propensity towards people that have some thing that they're trying to heal or make better tend to do a little bit higher fat and people that are already relatively lean and maybe want a little bit better performance in the gym, maybe want to build a little bit more muscle, um, tend to be a little bit lower in that ratio, a little bit closer to one to one. So th there's going to be some experimentation that's necessary. Um, as I've been getting ready for this bodybuilding contest, I started off very high fat and relatively low protein, like 70 to hundred grams a day. And I found that, um, as I got leaner, my desire for fat diminished and I wanted more protein. And I, I still am keeping things relatively fast and loose with my diet. I have days where I want more fat and I have days where I, I want more protein and I'm trying to just listen to 
my body's cues with what I feel I need on that day. Um, but I can tell you that, you know, six plus months ago, right around the time Jonathan and I started talking and for some time before that, um, I was having a lot of um, emotional issues. I was going through a really hard time in my life. And for me, eating really, really high fat, I was eating 85% fat, which is basically three grams of fat to one gram of protein. That's what made me feel most emotionally stable and helped me best process everything that I was going through. Um, but that's just my own N equals one. So if you want to try it, go for it. But um, be aware that a certain pattern is starting to emerge the more people that do carnivore and um, you may not have the same experience they do, but that could very well be because your body isn't necessarily in the same position that theirs is. Perfectly said. Yeah. It's very individual. Um, do you remember we discussed something about the insulin load in the body and when you go too low in the fat and or, or too, sorry, too low in the protein and too high in the fat. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So basically what, what I'm theorizing is that as Jerome's getting leaner, um, he's requiring more protein to signal the insulin in his, in his, well, his hormone, hormonal blood insulin levels um, to inc increase his electrolyte storage. That's what I'm theorizing. Because I think that when you start to get leaner, you start to dump things quicker. So I notice myself, um, when I'm very lean, I'm, I'm more thirsty than I'm going, I'm urinating more often. So it means that I'm losing more electrolytes. That's my theory of why, you know, more, the leaner you get, my theory is the more protein you need. Um, yeah. Obviously, if you want to keep that performance, you're not trying to get very, very lean like Jerome is right now to get stage lean, um, then you'll increase the fat. But Jerome knows... You know, it's a certain ballpark you have to follow um, to sort of get lean, but also not suffer too much. So if Jerome could, for example, lose like kilos upon kilos of fat in a week, if he wanted to, just doing a protein sparing modified fast, then that would give him you know, close to zero sleep rather than a little bit of sleep. Um, <laughs> and he'd feel like crap. And he wouldn't be able to go to the gym and his three sessions of high intensity training, 18 minute fitness would be diminished and gone. And probably you wouldn't <laughs> be doing them. So, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And we just added a bit more to that. So Tom said, I agree, but I don't care for percentages, calories, etc., which you use sometimes. And I'm finding that realistically it's impossible to measure accurately. Just enough protein, loads of fat. Yeah. Yeah, like Jerome just said as well about the fat. So you just eat enough protein because the protein is an essential nutrient. Um, it gives you the vitamins, um, the minerals that you need. Um, the, the only problem is... Obviously, you need enough fat for the fat soluble vitamins. Um, you need the cholesterol from the fat portion as well. Um, mm. In addition to that, you know, protein runs too low, you lose muscle. Fat, you know, you can kind of up and down it. Your body will it will give you feedback if you're eating too much. You know you're eating too much, you'll get fat. Or your body feels stuffed. Or at night time, when you're lying there at night and you're thinking, oh, my God. Like, I know sometimes I make the carnivore protein butter bites and I'm having two or three some nights because I'm trying to load up from my lack of butter bites during the day. They're one of my main <laughs> sources of fat. And um, I'll be having like three of them at night. And I'm like, oh my God. And in the morning, I don't really feel hungry because I've eaten too much. So my appetite is less. Therefore, my first meal, which I usually have about half seven, eight o'clock in the morning, I'm not really wanting to have. So I'm sure you know, Tom, you'll, you'll be listening to your body and finding out what works for you. And it's, um, it's all over the shop. Your body's dynamic. And even Jerome, he's yep. shredding for a competition. He's, a, he's accepting now it's not going to be, you know, perfect macros every day. It's better to ballpark it. And same is true of all my clients. I say to them, you know, hit this for a good few weeks. Um, give it an honest try, you know. And if you're feeling like really hungry or you get certain symptoms after a period of time, then you adjust it. Um, some days you'll require five grams more fat and five grams less protein or any sort of permutation of that. So you got to listen to your body and not try and fight that um, curve too much in terms of what you what you're trying to achieve because you'll suffer for it immensely. And if you are, if you do end up picking some macro ratio that you're trying to hit, um, be careful of food selection because I remember once I bought some steak at the store that looks pretty good. I didn't really look at what cut it was, but then when I looked at the nutrition label, it was really, really lean. So to hit the ratios that I wanted to hit, I had maybe eight ounces of steak, but I think I had to have a whole stick of butter with that. And I was, 
pan frying a lot of the steak in the butter, but I was also eating half a stick while I was cooking dinner. And I remember thinking at that point, you know, I'm hitting a ratio for the sake of trying to hit a ratio. And this isn't, this isn't probably, you know, ancestrally appropriate that we would just force ourselves to eat fat, you know, for no particular reason. Like truthfully, we would probably cycle through periods of higher protein, lower fat and higher fat, lower protein, uh, depending on what was available. Um, so either way, whatever you decide to do, definitely keep us updated. I'm, I'm curious how that goes for you. Yeah, perfectly well said. Thank you very much. Um, so you said pull-ups and dead hangs are working well for my grip. That was your suggestion, I think, Jerome, wasn't it? Uh, possibly. I know that I'm a big fan of dead hangs for shoulder traction and for overall mm. shoulder health. Uh, John Kirsch has an excellent book on rehabbing most shoulder injuries just by hanging for 10, 15 seconds a day, a couple times a day. Mm. Very good. Yeah. Um, I don't care much about grip at all. I've got quite quite thin little wrists, but then like quite big sort of forearms, so I don't hmm. don't tend to worry. I think uh, I've I've got odd, odd odd shaped little fingers as well. You probably see here. <laughs> it's like gripping a bar is like it's not working for me. It's, hmm. I'm never going to be able to grip a bar that well. Um, never mind. Eh? Right. Um, my n equals one. I increased my fat until my digestion said no. Felt well. Sleep was good. Very low appetite. I added half a stick of butter to my usual carnivore. Fair. I've cut it back now. Yeah. Sounds all right. Yeah, with, with fat, you have, um, your gallbladder's got to secrete the enzymes, um, the bile acids to deal with the fat. And some people think, oh, I'm going to go from 60 20 or 60 40 by ratio to 80 20 by ratio. I'm like, don't do that overnight. That's insane. You'll be like effectively doubling your fat intake or something. So, um, do, do periodically increase it or decrease it um, slowly, transition very slowly. I know when I started on the fat, I think the most I could eat, when I st up until recently, maybe a few months ago, I was eating about 200 grams of fat and that was as much as I could eat. Um, now I can get as high as I want near enough. Um, at least well, maybe like 350, 400, so it's about as high as I could get, but not for very long, you know. Really <laughs> stops you. Yeah, definitely transition slowly. Because if um, if you don't, most of that fat will just run right through you, and um, you don't want that to happen. So when I first decided to try 85% fat and 15% uh, protein, which is, I think, two and a half grams of fat to one gram of protein, um, I just did it right away. And that was the same way I, I tried carnivore. I just did it, you know, absolute starting one day. And it took... It took probably at least six weeks before I could constantly digest and absorb that much fat. So I would, I would highly recommend uh, most people, if you decide to make significant changes to your diet, ease into it over at least a month. That's great advice. Yeah. Yeah, these things take time. Um, do you want to have a ramble for it? But Jerome, what do you reckon? Ooh. Um, how's your training going? Not bad, not bad. Um, I did some leg press today, um, which is, I've not done this leg press before, so I've not done the, the diagonal leg press, you know, where you're pushing upwards towards the platform. I've done the horizontal mm. ones. Um, the diagonal one actually felt better for my back. I'm thinking because rather than pushing my incision point like that way, if that, if that, makes, sense, if that makes sense, it kind of um, pushes it upwards sort of thing on my upper, upper part of my back. So yeah. I feel like the pressure goes at my upper back rather than my lower back, if that makes sense. Um, obviously, I put my, my glutes off the pad about an inch or two. I find my mobility is better when I do that. And it doesn't fix my glutes and lower back in position, so it feels awkward and tight. Uh, so yeah. I do have, like, bolts in my back, so I can feel that when I'm lying down, sat down. I physically mm -hmm. feel like there's something in my back, which is really awkward sometimes. But, um, yeah, so I did... The way I, the way I basically did that was... Um, I believe it's my I'm trying to think now. So I did abductors, so glutes. Um glute ham hyperextension, so just a hyperextension but glute ham focused. Mm -hmm. Then leg extension, then the leg press, then 
the leg curl, then I think I did adductors after that. Um, yeah. I put the hamstrings last because my hamstrings are quite a strong point, so I don't, I'm not too focused on that sort of thing. <laughs> um, yeah. I find my hamstrings activate well. I can train them hard. You know, I don't, I don't focus too much on that. But the quads are something I'm quite conscious about, um, mainly because hamstrings you can train quite hard and quite well, quite safely with a spinal fusion. Um, quads are a different story. I can't really put much weight on my shoulders or my back. So um, I'm having to sort of pre-exhaust that and focus more on getting more of my workout on the quad area anyway. Um, so yeah, it's pre-exhausted. And I actually filmed that today and I, I think it was about a minute and a half set. Um, it wasn't... I mean, I did three sets of 16, so obviously I didn't train hard enough. And say, you know, if I did three sets of 16, it means the weight wasn't enough. Um, yeah. If I did three sets of 16, 15, 15, you know, obviously not as good as the first set. So I've mm -hmm. rested too much or it was too easy. Um, but what I do know is that if I went heavier, I would have hurt my back. If I did more reps, I would have hurt my back. So what you'll see in the set, which I believe will be uploaded on Saturday or Sunday this week, so nice. tomorrow or the day after, uh, I think it's like leg day motivation video or something like that. Um, mm. You'll see that I actually use my hands just to keep the the, the weight racked. So I, I sort of tapped my, my thighs first for like two reps. I was like, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. And I was like, okay, then my knees like stopped. I was like, okay, this weight's not, the weight could go if I pushed it, but I'd yep. risk injury. So what I did is I just pushed, pushed my knees, racked it straight away. Um, so that's as safe as I can get to a pressing movement with my legs without um, yeah. was training hard whilst not hurting myself. So that's kind of how I got around it. Yeah, it's, I quite enjoyed that. Excellent. I was going to say short of like, going? good. I was going to say short of doing something like a leg extension, immediately supersetting that with a leg press. Um, but even then, uh, even then that can be, that can be really tough sometimes. Leg presses can be a little finicky, even those horizontal ones, because a lot of people don't, realize that the seat oftentimes depending on the machine is is capable of moving at a wide variety of angles and people often have it sitting too far upright when you should probably be you know at least 45 maybe even 30 degrees backwards um on a horizontal leg press but the training is going well i'm incorporating a lot of um a lot of isometric work at this point I'm doing a lot of time static contraction at least to me um, I feel on certain movements that I'm able to generate a, a higher degree of intensity on a time static contraction compared to doing a more dynamic exercise. Um, I have a couple of cable attachments for like doing tricep pushdowns, but my triceps feel most heavily worked when I'm basically pushing against an immovable object for 90 seconds with a, a really high degree of effort. Um, but at some point in the future, I'm going to make a, a whole video on time static contractions, and I'll include some training footage on that. But it looks like we've got a couple more questions. Oh, yeah. We'll have a luxury. Um, I'll get for it in order. Um, so Carl said, Jonathan, I've been using the chronometer app we discussed, trying to get used to it. Nice one. Yeah, the, the all these apps are, depends who you ask, um, they'll have a different opinion on them. I've used all of them. Chronometer is the best for me and the most accurate. Um, I like the display. It makes sense to me. I've had some issues with it where it's not been easy, where they've made an update and it's actually made it worse quite a few times. But overall, it does the job for me. Uh, you know, but then what can you do? You can't please everyone. I'm, I'm one of those people you can't always please. <laughs> so I've been getting 90% of my macros in one meal. Make up for it in a second. In the second. How many meals today for both of you? Um, so I'll, I'll address the second part first. So I'm eating four meals per day. I can do three meals per day, but I find I just feel a bit sick and sluggish after those three meals, if I'm doing three. Um, I'm probably an exception to the norm. Dr. Chafee and Sean Baker, I believe, have one or two meals per day, and they, they, they have, have probably the same amount of food as me. They're fine. So whatever it is, I don't know, but that's just them. Um, they've probably got, got more um, digestive capacity than me. Uh, you know, so it's probably that as well. What about you, Jeremy? I think you're on two meals, isn't it? Yeah, the one to three. Um, again, so much of this contest prep I'm doing kind of fast and loose, um, just based on uh, what my body's telling me. So most days um, I'll have a really light lunch and then a, a pretty significant dinner. 
um, kind of the same. I get a little bit tired after eating, so I, I usually feel better on fewer meals. But on training days, I'll usually train um, a little bit before lunch, and then I'll go home and I'll have a really, really big lunch, and then I'll still usually have a bigger dinner at night. So my training days, I'm eating heavier, and my non-training days, um, I'm usually not hungry for breakfast, so I don't eat it. But if I'm if I'm hungry, I'll have four eggs for breakfast, and then kind of the normal, relatively light lunch, and then a fairly heavy dinner. Yeah, for, for me, it's um, kind of about digestibility as well. So, of my four meals, they all I think two of my meals are similar, and two of them are completely different. So, my first meal is usually eggs, cheese. At the moment, it's whey and milk, kefir. Um, second meal is usually a shake, which is whey, raw milk, or kefir, kefir and raw eggs um some ice as well so i just make it like a slushy that digest pretty quick um sometimes i like heavy heavy cream to that or something then meals three and four usually meat with eggs with cheese or fish or something like that um so you know it's, it's never the same sort of thing it's just the first two meals are more what you might call digestible quicker sure. more sort of mashed up sort of thing um that's just the way i like to do it i like to, i don't like to feel bogged down around training which is after meal one Four meal two. Um, and as for you, you asked about how many meals per day. Yeah, I mean, you, you can get it into one meal if you're eating all of them. But if you're stuffing yourself and feeling, oh, this is hard work, split up into two. Um, I mean, I think meals should contain both protein and fat and be quite equal in that kind of regard. Um, I have been known to have a lot of fat in my first and last meal, which is the way I prefer to do it most of the time. Mm. But it's so individual i don't think there is a way to do it um most people that i speak to on a carnival diet are doing two meals per day that's just my own anecdote it doesn't mean it is the way to do it but it's just, it just seems to be what most people i've spoken to have been doing what have you noticed during have you noticed the trend in what people say they do or okay yeah it seems like most people do two kind of lunch and a dinner for most um and the whole adding fat thing is interesting I, I tend to think for the most part, your, your cravings will tell you, you know, whether you want ground beef or whether you want one cut of steak over another. Um, and unless you're, unless you're kind of in that group of people that especially a lot of women in the carnivore diet recently are, are moving more towards heavier fat, you know, eating a stick of butter a day. Um, I have some mixed thoughts and feelings about that. Um, but I tend to think, you know, for most cuts of meat, you know, if you're craving it, that's probably closer to the, protein to fat balance that you need in that particular meal if it sounds good if you're eating and it's appetizing it's probably about right yeah um I mean, the thing is carl if you're having say 50 percent of your macros in meal one 50 percent meal two are you really hitting the spot between those two meals i mean it depends I'm trying to remember how much you're eating i believe you're eating about 120 of each roughly protein mm -hmm. fat um that might do it yeah, try it out. You could try two meals, so try two equal size meals. Um, you might notice that your training performance is, is better if you backload it or front load it. If you assume you train in the, in the middle of your training in your between your two meals, um, just do whatever optimizes your performance, makes you feel good, helps you sleep at night, makes you feel better. I don't I don't have an honest answer for you because I don't know. Um, that's probably the least sensationalistic, least. Uh, requested response a lot of times but the fact is i don't know what do you think is that is that like what you think or what do you reckon Drew? yeah in, in general um and and protein especially is going to be kind of gradually absorbed throughout the day um so i my personal preference is i like a big dinner or i like a big meal after working out but if i were to step back uh, i think it's probably better to keep more of your meals roughly the same size um there's probably a certain degree of if you're conditioning yourself to have one really, really large meal, your body kind of becomes used to that and is expecting a bigger meal. And that can kind of affect your hunger signaling maybe. Um, to look at that from the other side, I tend to think people that have a significant amount of weight to lose on the carnivore diet in a lot of ways um, might do a little bit better having a couple more meals a day, but keeping those meals relatively small and to try and condition their stomach to having smaller portions um, that they can satisfy more easily instead of just trying to have one, maybe two really large feedings a day. Um, but again, that that's going to be highly individualized. Yeah, the only thing I'd add to that is um, 
when you anticipate a meal, you'll probably digest it better. I had a meal earlier and I, 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 I wanted to eat, I knew I had to eat because I'm going to eat, eat after this, um, this podcast here, but um, it didn't digest well. I didn't feel up for it, but I knew if I didn't eat, I'd get so far behind that tonight, I'd have to eat two meals in one go. Mm. Um, not usually what I'd recommend, but you know, I've got quite serious goals, and the way I am is that I always hit my goals, or at least do my best to hit them. Um, and that's not the, the healthy way to do it, so it's not what I'm advocating, but you know, what can you do? Um, and I'd just do whatever causes you the least amount of stress. You know, if you're, if you're stressing about having two meals versus one, just whatever causes you the least amount of stress, and people never mention this, it was just that, say what's optimal for performance or building muscle or burning fat. Um, what makes you feel good? What makes you sleep at night and what gives you the least amount of grief and hassle? <clears throat> so lots to look at. Um, I don't, we don't have an answer, basically. <laughs> Um, question, what are your thoughts about the neck exercise and should you or should you not train any benefits? Um, I don't train traps or upper traps at least because they grow too quickly and it means I can't turn my head <laughs> and it causes me pain sleeping at night. It means I can't breathe very well. I look like a bubble head. Um, I don't like that, so I don't train. I don't train neck. Um, I think it's straightforward up and down shrug, so it's just up and down. Um, so you're not doing all this... I don't believe in like ro rolling your shoulders forwards and back. I think that's ridiculous. Um, changes the center of your gravity. I think if you want to work a muscle, it should be up and down. If you're your upper traps, if you want to work slightly across your maybe uh, the lower part of your upper traps. Maybe just do a, a a prone sort of lying on a bench sort of shrug, so you're leaning forwards a little bit. So whatever wherever it is, make sure your your body is in a straight line sort of thing. Um, a dumbbell shrug, a Smith machine shrug, a cable shrug few variations what do you think Drew? yeah i i took that from a different context i i think he was talking about maybe uh like neck flexion extension or lateral flexion um and if that's uh, what big yeah, was I talking about right, then then i would highly highly recommend those uh if and this is a big if if you can do it safely because not training your neck is going to be better than training your neck incorrectly or training your neck poorly and you see way too many gadgets and widgets where you can like take a, a belt and strap it to your head and put a, a free weight attached to it and do stuff with your neck. Um, don't do that. I, I would not advocate that style of neck training for anybody. If, and you're probably not going to have it, but if someone has access to a MedEx or a Nautilus four-way neck machine, I would recommend that. Um, but short of having that particular machine, um, I sometimes have people here in my studio do isometric neck extension or neck flexion. Um, but there's a lot that goes into that. So I don't generally tell people, um, or I don't give advice usually on exactly how to do that because I would, if I don't have someone here in my studio to make sure that they're performing it safely and correctly, my concern is they're going to mess it up and they can cause quite a lot of strain on the neck. But to emphasize the importance of neck training, um, Mark Asanovich, a 20-year NFL strength and conditioning coach, would have his NFL players, uh, they would all do neck work. And he's pointed out a couple of different studies that show an association. So obviously, you know, correlation can't prove causation, but there was a strong association where with like every 10% an increase of strength in the neck flexors and extensors, um, the concussion rate in those athletes went down significantly, as did um, the severity of the concussion. Again, that's just association, but it makes sense that stronger neck muscles will do a better job, you know, keeping your head in a in a proper position upon impact. Um, so, yes, I recommend neck training. Um, I could tell people how to do it, but I don't directly tell people, yes, you need to do neck training um, because it's far too likely they're going to perform it incorrectly. Um, if you want to learn how to do it, Doug McGuff or Drew Bay have excellent videos on how to safely train your neck, um, but I won't get into those specifics here because it feels a bit like a liability. Yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things, if you want to work the muscles that um, Jerome was outlining, then do it properly, do it safely. Um, follow someone that is like an actual expert, someone that can actually show you what you're doing. Use the right equipment. Um, yeah. And um, I apologize not, not for... Something I... 
I apologize for laughing at you initially because I, I think of how many guys want to have bigger traps and you see guys, most of them um, would do anything to have these just giant boulders on either side of their neck. And you're like, yeah, I don't really do much to work it. <laughs> yeah. The, the one of those muscle groups that just don't, um, for me, I, I probably get away with not training calves, biceps and traps. Um, quite quite well and get you know get away of it as in people wouldn't really notice the difference sort of thing um yeah but then i've got rubbish triceps and not for, for me not great quad sort of thing um, my lower back is terrible obviously so. <laughs> <laughs> oh well as far as Brilliant. training traps, if we're, if we're talking specifically about the, the fibers above the neck, because the, the, the traps are like a diamond shaped muscle that runs down the back and you have fibers that pull in literally every direction. So if we're just looking at that, I tend to think they get a pretty good overload doing an overhead press. If you're capable of doing a shoulder press, cause they just function to elevate the shoulder. Um, and then same kind of thing, depending on how you're doing a shrug, I would recommend dumbbell over barbell. Um, I like to lean, if I do dumbbell shrugs, I like to lean slightly forward. I feel like that gives my shoulders a little bit better of a path instead of, instead of you see people like shrugging their neck down and shrugging their shoulders up. I find if I put one foot forward, a couple of feet, lean forward, maybe between five and 10 degrees and do a shrug from there, it uh, feels a little bit more natural for me, but you don't have to yeah. overcomplicate it. Yeah. I don't mean about people like move their head whilst they're doing it and that's, that's, that's daft in itself. I mean, you move your, your the position of your body the way the, the way that your um the the bar the dumbbell or bar path is in relation to your body. Don't move your oh, right. There, yeah, moving your strange. head down is not the same as moving your shoulders up. <laughs> Funny, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> yeah. All right, we've got the last question now. Uh, then we will have to go, guys. Um, that's with the exception of if I receive a mighty, mighty super chat. <laughs> um, in which case this will be the last question guys so thank you for tuning in um, so Ben asked I have recently discovered the tri-tip and has become one of my favourite underrated cuts of beef any other cuts you gents have found to be underrated um, we get beef briskets quite often um, we find uh, oh, I'm trying to think that would have been dollars and pounds oh god conversions is it, I think we pay about eight eight British pounds for about a kilo, or sometimes a bit less, maybe seven British pounds sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, so two two and a bit two and a bit pounds of beef for nine dollars. <laughs> I'm guessing something like that. If you're looking at that sort of conversion, um, it's affordable for us, I think, and most people can probably afford that. Um, I don't eat much meat funny enough i probably eat less than a pound of meat a day most days um which surprises a lot of people but that's how much i eat so, yeah it's not too expensive for me the carnival diet is not expensive for me to follow yeah um what about you jerome what cuts do you get over there i um i really like cube steak i know a lot of people don't because it's really tough um but for the most part there's a couple of different stores around the area that i go to and if something is marked down i'll buy it so a most of the time, you know, probably 13 out of every 14 days, I eat ground beef and eggs. Um, I rarely have a steak. A steak is kind of a nice treat. You know, if I sign a couple of clients within a short window, I'll get a, a New York strip or a ribeye. Um, but then otherwise, if something is marked down, then I'll just buy that. And, and sometimes I get salmon that way. And um, yeah, I it's interesting when you get to a point when you've been doing carnivore long enough where you can tell that top round tastes a little bit different than bottom round and some cuts are a little bit more meaty or earthy compared to other cuts. Uh, that's kind of an exciting time to be a carnivore, but I don't really go out of my way to get one cut over another. If something's cheap, I'll pick it up. Um, maybe that's just like my inner business owner trying to save every penny I can and be economical, but I don't, I don't fret too much over it. The same as us, really. Yeah. So what Sophie and I do do, which we did actually today, was went to Tesco, which is our big superstore that's near to us. Um, usually, we're going to the butcher to get most of our meat, but sometimes we'll go in to get the extra things, which we won't you won't find in a butcher. Um, reductions. What, reductions. We go for the reductions. The the, yep. the sit. What do you call it? The the bin. The reduction. The reduction bin. 
if we go down there and I'll actually walk ahead to get to it before everyone else sort of thing. Um, and I'll just check through and see if there's like usually cheaper packs of beef mints, the ground beef. Um, today we got um, five non-broken eggs and one broken egg for £1.35 down from £2.70. But there's actually six unbroken eggs, so they thought it was broken when it wasn't. So we got six eggs for half the price. So I was like, I'm going nice. to take that. Um, yeah, that was the only box, unfortunately. But um, yeah, we also got, we usually get like some chicken or something or um, two yeah. rescues on offer. Quite um, economic with what we do. I just seem for you'd be surprised. You, you can buy some really tough cuts. And if you slice it really, really thin and just a little bit of salt on it, um, it, it can be surprisingly tender if you slice it really thin. So, um, I don't know, maybe I just need to be a little bit more adventurous with the type of meat that I buy, but I usually just buy what I can get on the cheap. Yeah, Sophie actually does that with some of the steaks she buys. She'll um, get them to cut up for her and she'll have it mm -hmm. like thin stir fry strip sort of steaks and mm -hmm. yep. have salt and pepper on it or something. Yeah, melt with butter. Melt with butter. Jesus. Hello, Maggie. How's it going? And hello, Rick again from Miami. Bavette or flat iron. Yeah, so we can get Bavette or Flat Irons in one of our supermarkets, but not others, which is weird. Uh, Morrison's is basically the UK go-to supermarket for carnivores, apparently. That's what we, we go to. Um, they do Denver, Denver Steaks as well, which is quite interesting. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't eat steaks very often, Jeremy, but I probably have a steak, maybe. I think I've had two this year. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have yeah, a but... lot. I... I rather just have ground beef or just eggs but yeah it seems to be an exceptional circumstance i don't know many people that do actually eat um other than like sean baker and dr chafee which they're like doctors you know they have like they probably own like <laughs> six digits or something plus so yeah no wonder why they're buying ribeye steaks and having like three of them a day I probably have one yeah. A week. yeah sophie has about one a week so it's exception to the rule uh, most people i speak to have have ground beef with eggs and stuff like that yeah oh and chuck eyes um usually if a store is doing a sale on chuck roast they'll usually slice chuck eyes and to me a chuck eye is every bit as good as a ribeye um but at a fraction of the cost yeah name of man's made of money excellent, <laughs> excellent. very good i don't like lobster that much i think it tastes like salty mozzarella <laughs> I know, right? I'm probably the only person in the world that thinks that's. Yeah. Yeah. I've got no taste of it. <laughs> All right. We'll wrap this up now, guys, anyway. Um, do you have any closing thoughts, Jerome, before we um, go? Or... No, I just wanted to thank everybody for their time. There were some amazing questions today. Um, I appreciate every single one of you taking time out of your busy days to pick our brains. Um, I get a lot of fulfillment out of this and a lot of camaraderie. So a big thank you to every single one of you. Yeah, thanks, guys. We'll see you on Monday night. I believe the same time. I have to ask Sophie. I'll check with check with the boss. <laughs> All right, take care, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.